I found that it's important for me to talk about my experience because so many women, you know, deal with the struggles of PCOS or have traumatic pregnancies like I did. Have you ever dreamt of singing on a big Broadway stage? Well, that has literally been my dream since I was a little girl. And my guest today has been living that dream. Since she was nine years old, actress and singer Leah Michelle has been performing on Broadway in countless musicals. And she's delighted audiences for years in her most well-known role as Rachel Berry on the hit show Glee. But this past year, Leah's life changed completely as she took on her dream role as a mother after giving birth to her baby boy ever. The road to motherhood was not easy, however, and during our conversation, Leah opens up about the heartache and setbacks that came because of PCOS and infertility. And she shares why no one really knew what she was going through. Leah is raw and real and absolutely lovely, and I cannot wait for you to hear from her. Do you have a pressing question about parenting but don't know who to ask? Well, we are women supporting women, and we've got you. I'm Vanessa Quigley, and welcome to the Mom Force Podcast, brought to you by Chatbooks. Before we get the conversation with Leah going, I want to share a photo tip with you just in time for the holidays. Did you know that you can print more than one copy of your photo books through the Chatbooks app? That means that as you create photo books filled with your favorite family memories throughout the year, all you have to do come holiday time is order duplicate copies to gift to the grandparents or the godparents or the (laughs) in-laws. Holiday shopping can be hard. Chatbooks is easy. And if you haven't started a month book subscription yet, now is the time. Use promo code SEASON3 to get your first book free. Hello, hello, Leah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Well, I know you're in New York for Fashion Week. I've been following along on your posts on Instagram. (sighs) So glamorous, so gorgeous. I love how you also show the other side when you get back to the hotel and you're putting baby to bed. And a pro mama move, balancing the bottle on your chin. Oh, yeah. Love it. I mean, I... (laughs) I have yet to master a lot of things, but that I can say I have mastered the balance bottle on the chin while while feeding the baby. But no, it's wonderful being here right now in New York City for Fashion Week and especially as, okay, here's the here's the question, guys. Can I still say that I'm a new mom even though my son is 12 months old? Yes. I still call myself a young mom, even though my youngest is 13 and I'm almost 50. I will always be a young mom. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, I'm at least going to give myself another six months of saying as a new mom. Yes. But yeah, just, you know, it's like you put on a new skin as a new mom and it's nice being able to kind of do things that remind me of my myself outside of, you know, my role as a mother and to get dressed up and to, you know, put on makeup and beautiful clothes. But honestly, I, you know, the, the, the real truth is, is everything really changes once you have a child and your priorities change. It's still so much fun and it's still really wonderful. I think that having the independence and your own separate life outside of your child is so important, but I just want to be with him all the time. And, you know, I, I want to make sure that I don't miss his naps and that I don't miss the bottles and that I don't miss giving him a bath and putting him to sleep. Last night I was getting ready for an event and I was all ready. And I looked at the clock and I was like, I have time. I'm going to give him his bath. And so I was like in this long gown, giving my son a bath. And I was like, this is the best thing in the whole world that I get to do both. And be able to take care of him and also, you know, do what it is that I, I enjoy doing. And I'm so fortunate also that I have my mother who gets to come and help me out and my husband who is so great with our son. So it's been a whirlwind of a week so far, but uh, we're making it work. Yeah. I hope someone snapped a picture of you bathing him in your gown, though. That would be <laughs> priceless memory to hold on to. We have it. I think there's a better one, though, of me changing his poop diaper. Okay, that works too. (laughs) I love it. I know so much of motherhood is like whiplash when you're trying to, you know, live your life as Leah Michelle, but then you're also mom and you have to be able to turn on a dime. And if that means changing a poopy diaper in a gorgeous couture gown, you know, (laughs) 
Bring it. That's that's the joy of motherhood. Well, I know that your journey to motherhood was a tough one, a lot of mm-hmm. unexpected things. And I want to talk more about that. But I first have to just get it off my chest that I am a choir girl oh. and I'd also a trained opera singer. But I really wanted to be on Broadway. Actually, I thought that's what I was I thought I was entering the, like, how to be a Broadway singer program in college, and I ended up in opera, which I fell in love with. But Mm. watching you on Glee as Rachel Berry was, it just kind of validated my decision, my life choices to join choir, even though my high school choir program was nothing like yours. I had major choir envy watching you on TV. Were you a choir girl in real life? You know, I started, first of all, an opera singer is so amazing. If I were you, I would just begin every sentence that I ever speak in just like the most incredible operatic tone. That is so amazing. I just, I'm so blown away and amazed always by opera singers because it just is, it's incredible. So you know that the opera singing has come in handy as a mother because when I need to project my voice, (laughs) you know, it doesn't sound as harsh as it could otherwise. So that's great. That's so great. I'm so like, I think that's amazing. I did some music stuff in school, but I was, I have been working in the industry since I'm eight years old. That was when I did my first Broadway show. And so it was important to myself and my family that outside of that, I did other things that weren't. So it wasn't always just about music and performing. So in school, I was on the debate team and I was on the volleyball team. And then I would leave that life and then I would go to work on Broadway. And it was a very, you know, kind of double life <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I was living. But I got to, uh, you know, work that muscle and and get to have that really, the the music fuel me up when I was performing. And I certainly missed it in in school, but I think it was great to be able to also try different things and make sure that I experienced as much as I, you know, could in school. Yeah, because as an actress, you're going to portray a whole host of characters and having as many life experiences as you can can only help with that. And kudos to your mom for trying to create some normalcy (laughs) on top of this like amazing career that started at such a young age. That's just... Well, let's just hope that I don't have to get cast in a movie as a volleyball player because that was... (laughs) I was just horrible. So... Oh, I love it. What So what is it about music? You started singing at a young age. Like, did you know then that this is what you wanted to do with your rest of your life? Like, what do you love most about music? Oh, wow. I mean, you know, having to say what you love most about music is like saying, like, what do you love the most about the sun or the ocean? It's like, it's, it's, it's everything for me. It's how I've always been able to find myself and I've music ha- I've used as a way to heal and to express myself and to find myself. Music was always playing in my home constantly. My father was playing Led Zeppelin and my mother was listening to uh, everything from Stevie Nicks to Aretha Franklin. And it was all different kinds of music playing all around me. And so I grew up with this love of of good music and I started p- performing and then it just became such a, a part of me and you know I have my album coming out in um, November called Forever which is dedicated to my son because his name is Forever and it's so important to me for so many reasons but mainly because music was such a key point of my upbringing and my childhood and it's now so integrated in my time with my son. And yeah. Well, I, music was my whole life too for many years. And then I had my first baby, well, actually while I was still undergrad. And so I didn't go to Europe to sing in all the grand opera houses Mm -hmm. that I'd hoped to do because I became a mother a little sooner Mm -hmm. than I had expected. And so my journey in music changed. And somewhere after I had my fifth baby, I realized I had quit singing completely. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm lucky. I'm. It's pretty easy for me to get pregnant. I had five kids in eight years. My first That's five. Unbelievable. Years. I know, and it was such a blessing. But all of a sudden, I wake up one morning and I can't stop crying, and I'm like, "What's wrong with me?" And mm-hmm. you know, 
postpartum. There's all kinds of stuff that happens postpartum. Oh, yeah. But one of the things was that I had music was not a part of my life. In fact, I even quit listening to music because it kind of made me sad because I was in I was so in the trenches of motherhood that music that was such an outlet for me and brought me so much joy and like you said, healing and peace and a way to express myself, it was completely missing from my life. So my dear husband, who recognized what was going on, found an audition for me for Aida and Aww. said, I'm taking the kids, just go. And I still had big, giant nursing boobs. I was I mean, my baby was like three months old. But I trotted out there and I got, maybe this is why I got the part of the mistress, <laughs> those big boobs. <laughs> but <laughs> I landed the role of mistress and got to do Aida for this little local community theater. And it, it just brought me back to life. Mm. And, you know, it was crazy at that time with five kids and a newborn trying to juggle, like, working every evening and all the weekends and everything. But it was like, okay, this this is what I need. And so yeah. we just made adjustments as we went on through life. But I think you'll agree. You've had some fabulous roles, some envious <laughs> roles that I envy, but nothing's better than the role of mother, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have a sweet little baby boy who just turned one named Ever. Congratulations. Thank you so much. But I know that your journey through pregnancy was not an easy one. And so can you just tell us a little bit about that? And you were diagnosed as having PCOS, which I know is fairly common and Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people deal with. But how did that affect your pregnancy? Wow. Um, How much time do we have? (laughs) I think it's important to always say that my journey is my journey and it, it, it certainly had its incredibly traumatic and scary moments. But at the end of the day, I'm so grateful that we were blessed with our son. And I know that so many women have journeys that don't, you know, end on that note. And so for me, no matter what, we were blessed with our son. And so it just, it makes everything like, you know, you sort of can move beyond it because he's here now. But I found that it's important for me to talk about my experience because so many women, you know, deal with the struggles of PCOS or have traumatic pregnancies like I did. And I found it really healing and helpful for me during my pregnancy to talk with friends or people that were experiencing the same thing. So in sharing my my journey, it's, you know, only sort of in, in, in hopes that there might be a, another, you know, mom to be or someone out there that can find a little comfort in knowing that they might be experiencing the same thing. But for, for me, I found out that I had PCOS when I turned 30. I decided to, or maybe 31, because I, I came off of birth control. I always knew that by 30, I wanted to stop. I'd been on it for maybe 15 years. And when I stopped, I didn't end up getting my period for an entire year because my my body was just completely out of whack and I didn't know what was going on. I gained 15 to 20 pounds. My skin broke out terribly. And I'm, I was working on a TV show at the time and the costume designer kept asking if I was pregnant because I was so bloated and they were struggling to put makeup on me to cover these huge cysts that I had. And I knew something was wrong and I knew that something wasn't right with my body. And I was diagnosed with PCOS, thankfully, because I know that a lot of women struggle and don't really know what's, what's, what's wrong, but I was diagnosed quite easily. And after that, I ended up having to have multiple surgeries in order to try and, you know, and and conceive to remove cysts and polyps and scar tissue. And the whole time I just kept saying to myself, like, I I remember laying down for one horribly painful procedure. And I just remember laying there being like, okay, baby, like I'm talking to you out there. And like, I know you're there and I, I just have to keep doing this. And all right, baby, like, we're getting closer. We're getting, getting closer. But finally my doctor, you know, after my third surgery, he was like, your body has been through a lot. Maybe let's just take a break and wait a little while. And then I got pregnant um, right after that, which was such a blessing and unexpected. And shortly after I was put on bed rest for some extreme bleeding that I started experiencing, which we didn't really know what that was from. And it was really scary. How far along were you then? I started, I found out I was pregnant. I was five weeks pregnant. And then I started bleeding two days later. So I had 
48 hours of bliss. Wow. <laughs> and I was in the middle of working and performing and it was very traumatic and scary to kind of feel like I wanted to not be working, but I had to. And I, I didn't know if that would affect the pregnancy, but I was put on bed rest. And, you know, a lot of the intensity, it, it continued throughout the pregnancy, unfortunately. The bed rest continued. We had some really intense markers that came up at our 20 week checkup, which required me. Now, at that point, we were in the height of our pandemic. It was um, April 2020. And I had to have multiple fetal echoes, fetal MRIs, you know, and it was terrifying. And I had a very intense amnio. So, you it kind of had, it was sort of a pregnancy that had all of the things that you really don't want to, to have to, you know, go through and deal with. But I, I honestly don't think it was until I was about eight months pregnant, maybe sometime in July, that we got all of our results back. Everything was okay. And then next thing you know, he was here. And so it was such a whirlwind and such a wild experience. And again, the reason why I feel like it's important to talk about it is because I, I was so scared. I only reached out to maybe one or two friends to let them know what was, what was going on. I didn't tell a lot of my friends because I was so afraid. And I really do re regret that. I wish that I had reached out and leaned on more people for support or let people know what was going on because I was sort of living in this horrible pain bubble. And looking back on it now, you know, I have the most incredible group of fierce friends, mothers around me. And it's a beautiful community that moms are all there to support each other. So yeah, I think it would have been definitely something that I should have used those resources. But yeah. like I said, our son came on August 20th, 2020. He was breached. So I had a C-section. I did everything to try and flip him <sighs> unsuccessfully, but I will never forget the minute I heard him crying. I just like broke down and I, when they ha handed him to me, I just looked at him and I was like, you did it. You're here. And, Aww. and then everything went away. And then, Cause then he had to fight to get here too. Like, he certainly oh, did. both worked so hard. He heard me. I, I remember calling my OB being like, can he hear me crying? Like, can, is, is, is he going to pick up on this anxiety and is, is this going to affect him? And, it, you know, I was so worried, but truly, and I know that this might sound cheesy, but I, that's when I started singing because I stopped singing when I was put on bed rest because I was so afraid, but then I just would like take a shower and I would like sing quietly. And I started singing songs because I just, that was like the only time and opportunity to like, let him know, like, I might walk out of this bathroom and we may have to go to a doctor's appointment or something stressful might be going on and you might hear things or you might hear me crying, but like everything is going to be okay. And those songs that I would sing to him are all on my album now. Mm -hmm. And because they're just special to me. And I also heard that if you like sing and talk to your baby, that then when they come out, they'll like recognize your voice. <laughs> I heard this. So I was like, look at him being like... <laughs> Do you recognize I was the one that was singing to you this whole time? So, Oh, my gosh. That is the <laughs> sweetest thing. I also heard that if you expose your, you know, child in your womb to music, that they mm -hmm. helps them be smarter. And so when I was pregnant with my first, I was singing Marriage of Figaro mm -hmm. and all like all day, all day, all day for months and months. And I was like, he's going to be a genius. And guess what? He got a 35 on the ACT his there first time. So <laughs> I think there's something worked. to it. It worked. it worked. Well, my hu my husband is the smart one in the in the family, so the least I could do is contribute yeah. some, you know, musical ability or something. And I also appreciate you saying that you wish that you had opened up maybe earlier so that you could have had that support. I think it was kind of, it's kind of an old-fashioned idea to not tell anyone until you're 12 weeks. I remember my mm -hmm. mom telling me that when I became pregnant first. And so I was careful not to tell anybody, and then at 12 weeks, we announced and everything with my first pregnancy went smoothly. And then my second pregnancy, I was following her advice. And when I went mm -hmm. in for, I got an ultrasound at 12 weeks and they didn't find a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I had miscarried that pregnancy and I was completely alone. 
mm-hmm. with my grief because mm-hmm. no one knew. No one and knew. And it was, first of all, I didn't expect that to be my journey. My mom, you know, had easy pregnancies and my first one was so easy that it caught me off guard and I felt like even some shame that I had done something wrong. So hearing you worry about like is singing going to, you know, or crying going to be hard on my baby, I think as mothers we we just make it, it feels like if something goes wrong, it's our fault. Of like, course. Maybe, you know, because actually with my second pregnancy, I wasn't that excited to be pregnant at that time. I wasn't ready mm-hmm. and I wasn't that happy about it. And when I found out I was miscarrying, I thought, well, maybe I brought this on myself because I wasn't happy enough and I didn't want it enough. So to hear you say you had some of those same feelings too. I think that's important to just get that out there, you know, that it's, those thoughts will come into your head, but they're not yeah. real. And it doesn't, it doesn't help, you know, I, everyone would be like, how was your 20 week checkup? And I was like, it was great. Everything was great. And then, then I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, if my friend who, let's say one of my friends, you know, then gets pregnant and goes to an appointment and it doesn't go quite well, then they're thinking, why is this only happening to us? You know, it, it went well for everyone else. Like we're the only ones that are experiencing this, you know, so, but I just, for me was so afraid. I, I, I was just so scared of like opening the door, but at the end of the day, I think that the support is is much more valuable. You're not the only one going through it. I mean, I thought mm-hmm. in the moment I was truly the only woman that had ever experienced a miscarriage. But right. come to find out the, when I started talking about it, like it's a very common thing and it can mm-hmm. be so lonely. But if we can talk about it, right. then we don't have to feel so alone. And I know that many, many women struggle from PCOS. So I think it's mm-hmm. so wonderful that you're sharing your experience because, you know, you're a celebrity. You're like, perfection in so many people's eyes. And so to know that somebody, you know, even Leah Michelle can struggle and have, you know, in fact, that you're so open about it. I think it's such a blessing. Does PCOS still affect you on a daily basis now? And is there something that you have found that is helping? Well, I, you know, right now I take metformin to help me mm-hmm. with PCOS and it will balance your insulin levels and, and help with that. But I, I currently am not on my proper diet that I should be for, you know, in in watching my sugar and carb intakes. I'm I'm generally a very healthy eater and I'm not a a person who loves sugar, like as far as sweets are concerned, but I have the love of my life here, which is bread. Uh And, (laughs) and it's like, I'm not, I'm not as like on my, my very good diet right now as I should be. But it, it, it is important. You have to be super mindful of, you know, especially the things that you are, are eating so that it doesn't um, affect the PCOS more. But it's something that I'm always going to have to watch and, and, and take care of. But luckily, when my doctor put me on the metformin uh, about a year or, or over a year ago, I haven't taken it since having the baby because I was breastfeeding for so long. And I kind of just want to see how my body is now going to readjust. But that was a really helpful medication for me when I first found out that I, when I was diagnosed, that helped me with the PCOS a lot. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So Ever is one years old now. And when you look back over the past year, like I'm sure all new mothers get unsolicited advice. Some good, not so great. Can you think back on a piece of advice that you got that was actually helpful like, what was the best piece of parenting advice that you got? Wow. Well, I have to say and give a shout out to some of my mom friends who have been so incredibly helpful. My one friend, Jamie, um, Jamie Lynn Siegler, she's an incredible actress and a mother. Yes, we know And her. poor Jamie, I call <laughs> her, I call her all the time. Like, yeah. literally like, okay, I have to take a long drive. What do I do with the baby in the car? And so. I'm really, really, really fortunate that my, my, the girlfriends in my life are all moms and super helpful. And I have a great list of women that I can reach out to for some amazing advice, but the best advice always comes from my mom and she's such an amazing mother, but maybe even a more amazing grandmother. And she just gives me the best advice. And I think that she just told me, you know, it's, it's a little bit more, it's like a, it's on a, it's a larger, it's not just like one little thing, but she always just said that, like, if you're good, like 
the baby will be good. And it doesn't mean that you always have to have it together. Like that's fine. But like, he's, you're like the extension of you. And so he's just looking to you. So like, if you guys are together and you're happy and you're enjoying, cause I'm always like, is he okay? Like, do you think he's happy? Like, did he have a good day today? Did we do enough fun things? And did he eat enough healthy food? And did he, you know, see the television on in the background for a few minutes and was that bad? And she's like, he's okay. <laughs> he's with you. You're his mama. He loves you. He's just so happy to see you smiling. And that always just comforts me. And then I, you know, and even when I'm, when I'm not around, like, I know that he is with my family. I hear him right now in the hallway, which is like that mom Aww. thing where you like <laughs> hear your child. <laughs> but that always comforted me to just know that like, you're not always going to make all of the right moves. You're not going to always do everything right. But like your baby just wants to see his mama there and smiling and feeling good and being together and I'm just super hard on myself, I think. And especially on the early days of being a new mom, I just felt like everything had to be perfect. And, you know, I think that it's something that I struggle with prior to being a mother, but even more so now that I'm a mom and just perfection and everything being okay. And she really just, my mother has always helped to just get me to relax and not be so hard on myself. Oh, you're so lucky. And I know that she lived with you, too, because yes. all the pandemic, you know, she yes. came for a visit and all of a sudden she's like, well, I'm staying, which was such a blessing. We, My mother flew out to Los Angeles in January and I was still very early on in my pregnancy, but still bleeding really badly. And I called her and I was like, can you please just fly out here and help me just get through my first trimester? I'm, I'm really scared. And my mother was an OBGYN nurse and pediatric nurse for 20 oh, wow. plus years. And she worked in women's health. So she knows so much. And I, and of course she's also my mom and she came and she stayed. And then it was February and things, we had a little pocket of things being calm and good before that dreaded 20 week checkup. But we were in March of 2020 and my mom ended up getting stuck in Los Angeles with myself and my husband where she lived for from that, that then until November. Oh. And so we were uh, three's company <laughs> for, for a while. <laughs> uh, well, your mom, it sounds like a wise woman. I think that's the greatest advice she could have given you because especially in the early, you know, phases of raising this brand new perfect baby, the, yeah. the stakes all feel so high and you mm-hmm. want to do everything right. But she's, she's exactly right. Like, Children are so resilient. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as they get older and they get a little mouthy and as a teenager, <laughs> you're going to be like, you're still going to be making mistakes, but they are so quick to forgive. And it's a beautiful relationship. And, you know, it's okay also for your child to see that mama's not always happy all the time. You know, as right. they get older, they will see and be able to, you know, be more in touch with their own emotions as they see you as a person with their ups and downs and highs and lows. But at the end of the day, you're the perfect mother for your child. And I love that she gave you that message. See, you said it much more eloquently than I did. (laughs) I'm, I'm, I I still have the mom brain right now. (laughs) Mom brain is real. Um, You mentioned perfectionism, which is, you know, something that a lot of people struggle with. And I can Mm -hmm. imagine when you are in, you know, the public eye for as many years as you were, and you know that everyone's watching your every move, that's a hard thing to probably mm. shake. And I know there's pressure on mothers everywhere to, as they say, bounce back mm-hmm. after having your baby, which is insane and unfair because honestly, it took me almost a year to get back into my old clothes after I had my first baby. And in fact, mm-hmm. even after that, I had shirts that still wouldn't button across. Even after the boobs went down, mm-hmm. my ribs were like sprung. Like they were, I was yeah. different forever. Mm-hmm. Did you feel any of that pressure to, you know, get your body back? And how mm-hmm. did you handle that being in the in the public eye? So I'm, I feel really fortunate that I've always had a very healthy relationship with my body and my weight. And I, I, my weight has gone up and down so much in in my life and due to my PCOS. So as far as feeling the pressure to bounce back physically, that wasn't something that was on the forefront of my brain, but I definitely felt extreme pressure, not from other people, but just from myself. This is just me continuing this theme of being hard on myself Mm -hmm. and not being more gentle. 
I, I, I felt so much pressure personally to feel like myself again and to be me again, whomever that was or whatever life was. And I wasn't processing or, or quite understanding my emotions. And I just kept feeling like, okay, I just have to like, just feel like myself again, where I have the energy to multitask and to, you know, get back to work and be able to speak to my agents and my managers and like, you know, be in that lane and feel like myself. And it honestly kind of came to a a head for me where I just, I kind of crashed a little bit. And a lot of my girlfriends were saying to me, they were like, you're going to, this is, you're, this is going to kind of come back to bite you. You know, if, if you are pushing so hard to be you at the 100% that you maybe were before. And I definitely had postpartum that I didn't realize that I was experiencing. And I also struggled a lot with postpartum anxiety, which not a lot of moms talk about, but it is a real thing. And it doesn't just go away after 12 months. It's like this thing where now that you're a mom, if you ever struggled with anxiety before, which I struggle terribly from anxiety that now it's like, it's completely intensified. And so I had to kind of come to a little bit of a moment with myself and just kind of stop and be like, life is different now. You are a mom. Yes, you're still you, but it's, things are different. You're going to feel different. You're going to have new emotions now that you have to deal with and you have to work through. I, you know, I think maybe before in my life, I'm very just like blinders, push through, keep going. And I had to feel a lot of things that I felt uncomfortable feeling. And so that for me was the biggest struggle was just this personal pressure to feel like myself again and be myself again. And now I'm just at this place in my life where I am Ever's mom, and I'm still me. And some days are going to be good, and some days are going to be hard, and some days I'm going to feel sad, and some days I'm going to feel great, and some days I'm going to have a lot of anxiety, and some days I'm just not. And that's like okay. It doesn't mean that you are not okay. So that's still something that I'm working through. Again, a way you give birth to this child, but then you are also reborn. You're a new yep. person and it's mm-hmm. never going to be the way it was, like mm-hmm. physically, emotionally, spiritually. It just everything shifts. All mm-hmm. of your perspectives shift. It actually reminds me of a question that we got on our Mom Force Facebook page. You mentioned your group of girlfriends that are such a huge support for you. We have that at Chatbooks in our Mom Force Facebook group. Thousands of moms that turn to each other when they need answers to questions. And when I posted that I was going to be interviewing you, we got a couple of questions that people want to ask. This one comes from Cassie. She says, how has becoming a mother changed your perspective on self-care and caring selflessly? Because now you have this other person in your life. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, my, my son is my number one priority now. Nothing matters more than him and his needs. And I, I've always known that I wanted to be a mom. And so I've, I've, I've known that that is something this, it comes very naturally to me just be like, he is my number one priority. And as far as self-care is concerned, that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, as far as shaving my legs, right. that doesn't exist anymore. But no, I, I think it's so important to still do the things. It really goes with what you and I were just talking about with taking care of your mind and your body, because it only helps me to be a better mom for him. So I've really gotten into meditation and just taking the first 10 minutes of my day before I go into his room to center myself, to help with my anxiety and to put me into a good place for the day. And that's just been really important for me. So, you know, some things are going to fall to the wayside when you have a a baby, like I don't care anymore about the things that I cared before about, like getting my nails done. It's like, what are you going to do? You have to clean bottles during the day and change your baby's diaper. And it's like, I don't need to have my nails done to do that. But it does feel nice when you can do it occasionally, but it's just not a priority anymore. But the things that as far as self-care should, that should be a priority 
are taking, making sure that us moms take care of our, our minds and our bodies and really whatever it is that makes you feel good is what you should do. That's what's the most important. And I think there's a misconception that the honorable thing is to sacrifice everything you are right. to be a mother and that actually you're going to be a broken person in the end. Mm-hmm. You won't be able to mother to the best of your ability. You got to take mm-hmm. care of yourself. So one of my girlfriends said to me, my dear girlfriend, Sherry, who is also another wonderful friend that I just have leaned on so much in my pregnancy and postpartum, but I was so nervous to start working again. And when I had to go to the recording studio to record my album, I called her crying and I was like, I don't want to leave my baby. I don't want to leave him. I don't want to be gone for the day. What if he forgets me? What if he doesn't love me anymore? (laughs) And she said to me, she was like, it's so important for him to see his mama going to do what she loves Yes, and that you are working and that you have a career that that you love and that you love to sing because he needs to see that so that then he, when he gets older, he knows, well, I want to find something that makes me happy as well. And I really appreciated that. And I needed to hear it. And that's why mom groups and friends are, are so important. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. You were talking about some of the things that fall to the wayside as we become mothers. Yes. (laughs) I don't do my nails anymore either. Another thing is sleep, right? Oh my God. (laughs) So little sleep. It's amazing how you can live on so little sleep. I, we had a, we had a very bad sleeper at the beginning and it was I can't, it's definitely one of those things like labor that you block out. Yes. You know, like you forget, (laughs) like I remember laying there during my C-section being like, I think I'm going to pass out. I was convulsing. I had like the shakes and I was like, this is, I'm, I just remember being like, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. And right now I'm like, if I have to have another C-section, like I'll be totally fine. (laughs) But like literally in that moment, I was like so petrified the sleep is the same thing. Like those sleepless nights, I exclusively breastfed our son, which is another thing. My girlfriends were like, you're insane for, Mm -hmm. for doing that. And I did, you know, all the feedings throughout the night and, um, he just would not sleep. And we finally did some sleep training, you know, when he got a little bit older and that first night, Oh, the first night, every mom knows that first night that you, that he sleeps through the night and you sleep and then you wake up and you like reach for the monitor. You're like, oh my gosh, You're is like, he alive? Happened? Is he breathing? <laughs> this is not oh, that is everything okay? <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Crazy. Oh. Well, I want to talk about your album. Yes. And w- one of the uh, surprises of motherhood, let me just say, start by saying this, is because I was a singer, I had grand ideas of what the lullabies were going to be that I sang mm-hmm. to my children. And I loved, I had a recording of Meryl Streep singing Garten Mother's Lullaby. And it mm-hmm. was the most beautiful, it kind of sounded Celtic and we're Irish. And so I was like, this is going to be the lullaby that I sing to my babies. Mm-hmm. And when I die, they're going to talk at my funeral about this lullaby. Like, I, it was going to be the thing. But it didn't work. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They didn't love it. I didn't Mm -hmm. come naturally. I felt like I was forcing it. And come to find out the lullaby that my kids wanted was my husband singing Home on the Range Mm -hmm. in his raspy, untrained voice. (laughs) That was the go-to lullaby. But I know you you mentioned that this album is full of all the songs that you sing to your son. And I'd love you to tell us a little bit about that in like I know I listened to part of one of them was an unexpected choice. Guns and Roses? Guns and Roses done lullaby. Because <laughs> Who knew? Why not? But you, you pull it off. I always loved the idea of making a lullaby record. Even prior to having a child, I always thought to myself that if I would be so blessed to become a mother, that I would love to make a lullaby record. And some other incredibly talented artists, you know, in the past have made lullaby records and I, I just love the idea. But I always thought that I wanted to make it. Of course, we sing Twinkle Twinkle at home together and we sing Little If You're Happy and You Know It, if I hear that one more time. But we sing those songs together. But I wanted to make a lullaby album that were full of songs that I loved as, as an adult that I could transform into lullabies. So that was my concept. And then when I was pregnant, as I mentioned earlier, it was really through singing that I was able to feel like I was making a connection with my son to let him know that 
everything was okay, despite a lot of the chaos and trauma that was happening uh, around us because of the pregnancy. And the first song that I started singing to him was Oh, What a World by Casey Musgraves. It was actually Mm -hmm. the first song that I listened to in the cab when I found out that I was pregnant, when I left the doctor. And I don't know what it was about that song. I just love Casey Musgraves so much, but it's just about, there are so many fascinating, unbelievable things in the world, but the most incredible thing is you. And so I knew immediately, I said, that song has to be on the album. And then I started singing Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses and just softly singing that when I was pregnant. And then in my mind, I said, that song has to be on. And and as I started singing these songs to my son, uh, Billy Joel and Coldplay, songs that I love so much, but I would sing them in much more soothing lullaby uniform, suddenly I had this whole album in my mind. And once I had him and I continued to sing those songs for him and play those songs for him, and he loved them so much, I knew that this was an album that I needed to make. And I spent the spring recording it in just a small little studio. And he would come sometimes and, uh, you know, just having him there was so wonderful. And I've made albums prior. This is my I think it's my my fourth album and I'm just the most proud of this record because every single song has such a personal meaning f- for me and I know that other mothers will love it to play for their children for their kids to listen to but also if you're not a parent and you just want a really nice soothing relaxing album to listen to it's great for that as well. Because they're all popular, recognizable songs. Yeah. Just done in a new What's way. the saying? It's kid tested, mother approved. Yeah. I played it for my son. <laughs> he loves it. It's mother approved. But I'm really so proud of it. And like I said, every single song on the album is something that has a personal meaning for me. This is an album I've wanted to make for a very long time. And then being able to call it forever because my son's name is ever is very special. Does he, do you think he has a favorite song yet? Can you tell? Oh, yes, he does for sure. He, he'll, my son knows how to say no, which is like, mm-hmm. why do children like, it's like the <laughs> it's one so thing. <laughs> it's the one dad, dad, and no. I'm like, really? And it's not even like we tell him no a lot, right. you know, but he'll go like, mm, 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 and he'll shake his finger. And so I'll click through the, the tracks on the album and he'll go, mm, 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 mm. And then it'll get to the one that's his favorite, which is a Coldplay song. And then he'll be like, ah, and he'll smile and he'll be so excited. And I was like, oh my God. And he'll now, if he wants to listen to music, he'll like shake his head to like, let me know that like he wants to like listen to music or he'll start like dancing. And we know that that like means he wants to listen to yeah. music. And I'm like, oh my God, my son wants to listen to music. Like, that's amazing. He's telling us it just makes me so happy. And this is such an exciting stage where he's, you know, almost 13 months and he's starting to talk, but even more so than talking, the communication is there where it's like, do you want to do this? And he'll say no, or why don't you pick what you want from here? Or why don't you tell me where you want to go? And he does. And it's like, wow, Mm -hmm. you are a person. Like you are a real person. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's the greatest gift that God can never give you. That's so true. Now, what if he comes to you in, one day and says he wants to go perform on Broadway and he <laughs> wants to pursue acting and life in the public <laughs> eye? But how are you going to counsel him? Uh, I think Gwyneth said this. She said, we tell our kids that, um, please, I'm totally butchering this quote, but it was something <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I think okay. we, we, it was something like I listened to, too, I think it was on the Goop podcast. And she said, we'll say it's okay with like, they can be whatever they want to be as long as it's like what we want them right. to be or something along those lines. And so I, of course, in my mind, I'm like, yes, be whatever you want to be. I support it. I think it's wonderful, but like, maybe don't be a singer or an actor, <laughs> you know? All that matters to me is that he finds something that he really, really, really loves. Yeah. I think that the indecision or, or being or being confused and not knowing, I, I, I wish nothing more for him than for him to just 
find something that he is passionate about because I was blessed with that at such a young age. And it really helped me so much to make positive choices throughout my adolescence because I had something that I was so passionate about that that mattered more to me than going to a party and drinking. So all I care about is that whatever it is that he wants it so much and it just brings him so much joy because that's what singing and acting has and and does for me. And if that's what he chooses, he at least has you coach him along the way, because I'm sure you have seen it all. Um, Hopefully he'll get my husband's voice, which is (laughs) not good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we got another question from our mom for us. This one's from Brittany, and she wants to know, what has been Leah's favorite work project? Oh, my God. That's really I know. Is it hard to choose? It's because these are like all of your little children, all of these, you know, projects and opportunities you've had. But what if you had to choose a favorite, what would it be? Well, I, I I have to say that this album forever is definitely one of my most favorite projects that I've ever done. But I also really love, I was in a Broadway show called Spring Awakening that was so special to me. It's where I met my best friend, Jonathan Groff. I loved playing that character. I obviously love performing on Broadway so much. No disrespect to Rachel Berry, whom I love very much. But that show was so special to me for so many reasons. One thing that I've noticed, and our business is all built around photos and taking mm-hmm. photos. And, you know, often as moms, we want to share photos, right? If I've noticed on your public Instagram that you haven't shared your son's face. You've kept that private, which I completely admire because that shows a ton of restraint because I'm sure he's gorgeous and you would love nothing more than to show the whole world your beautiful baby boy. My son has these eyelashes that are enviable. And I just would love, you know, yeah, Yeah. it's hard because it's more for my my friends and and family. And like, obviously, I have an incredible fan base of people who've been so supportive. And I've always opened up my life in, in that way. But Catherine Schwarzenegger said on her podcast, I love podcasts, by the way. (laughs) And she said on her, she was like the best thing that her parents gave to her was her privacy. And the minute I heard her say that, and I respect her so much as a woman and as a mom, um, not that it was ever a question of what my husband and I were were going to do when it came with our, to our son, but there are some things that we can't control. You know, we can't control if someone's going to take our picture on the street. And unfortunately we can't change that in our life for our son, but social media is wonderful in so many ways. And it's also very toxic in others. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely think that it was never a question for us that we were going to, to keep that part private, but I'm so sorry. Finish the rest of your question. I just got, (laughs) no, I love hearing your thoughts on that because um, I, I, I know there are lots of things that are special and almost Mm -hmm. sacred about family life. And it's not appropriate to put it all out there for the world to see on social media. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I know that you are still taking lots of pictures. Oh, yes. And one of the things that we talk about here at Chatbooks is the importance of seeing the magic in every day. And often we we can do that when we snap a picture. You know, you see a moment and you're like, I want to remember that forever. And so you take a photo. So I'm wondering, is there a photo that you have that captures one of those magical everyday moments? And will you describe it to us? Yes. (laughs) Okay. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this. And I don't know what people might think of me saying this. Um, This is a safe space, Leah. (laughs) It's a safe space for all your your thousands and millions of listeners who are now going to hear this. We're all moms. Um, We're all in the same boat. So. I, first of all, I delete like everything off my phone. I upload it onto my computer and then I delete it off my phone because I don't like walking around with so many personal photos on my phone. Smart. Yes. But I still keep the pictures on my phone of my delivery and like the first new photos of the baby, because it's, it's so strange that I like have to be like, I can't believe this happened. And I will always just be like, do you want to see a picture of my C-section? here it is. And people are like, I don't want to see it. And I'm like, I have a photo of my placenta as well. If you want to look at it, let's look at it together. You worked hard for that. That's crazy. So this is a little strange, but I don't know how you felt or, or how other moms felt, but ending my breastfeeding journey was very, very emotional for me. Like I could cry talking about it. I was very ready to be done. I had breastfed for eight months, which I was 
thrilled. I would, I would have been thrilled with, with one month, one week, you know, I, I knew that it's what I wanted to do, whether or not I would be able to, I was going to be okay with that. And I would never put any sort of pressure on having to give my baby formula. If that's what our journey was going to be, then fine. So, but I was so grateful that breastfeeding did come easy for me. So when it did, I was like, I have to keep doing this for as long as I can. But then it became really, really challenging with, I just wasn't allowing myself to eat certain things because of it. And I was just really ready to get into my body again. And I could tell he was ready to, like, I was really picking up on, on his cues. So I was like, okay, I think that this is, you know, coming to an end now for us. So then I just started taking like so many pictures of myself breastfeeding them. Good. I just want to remember this. And then I'd be like, what if today is the last day? And then like, I take a picture. So I just have so many pictures, like a selfie of me breastfeeding my son, which please God, never let him see when he gets older. But we'd be like, out in a farm and I'd be breastfeeding or we'd be like, you know, pulled over in, in the car breastfeeding. Like I, I, those are the real mom moments. And yes. it was something that I loved being able to do and beyond, beyond grateful that I was able to do it for as long as I did. And I was also so happy when it was done. And I love that I have these hilarious pictures of me just breastfeeding everywhere yeah. on myself. Now and now you can make a whole chat book of <laughs> Leah breastfeeding around the world. Oh God. <laughs> no. When I actually have so many pictures of me with my first, because I was also in awe of this thing yeah. that I could do. And we were living in Paris for the first three months of his life. Fancy. And so we were in Luxembourg, you know, Ooh. gardens. Take a picture in front of the mm-hmm. Hotel de Ville. You know, breastfeeding as I walk down the Rue de Rivoli. Take a picture. So exactly. I, I get I get it. You're my you're my kind of gal. You know, what we can do as women, it's, it's unbelievable. It's so unbelievable. And what our bodies can do, we are extraordinary, truly extraordinary. And so we should take as many pictures of all the awesome stuff that we do all the time. Amen. And you know, when I was pregnant with my last baby, I knew it was number seven. He was a little, he was a surprise. And I knew that that was going to be the end. I wanted a photo of what I look like nine months pregnant. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to hire a professional, but I just had my husband, I was in the shower and I just covered up some bits. Mm-hmm. And he took this photo, which is hopefully locked down in our photo album because my kids would die if they stumbled <laughs> on it. But I needed that. I needed to see if my eyes, like the oh, miracle yeah. that this body went through seven times bringing yeah. children wow. into the world. So unbelievable. I know. We'll just, just make sure, as long as we keep that photo, photo hidden. No, you shouldn't. Else. You just really like, should blow that picture up. I have to tell you the truth. Um, I have no problem showing everyone I know naked nine-month photos of yeah. me because I think it's It's a freaking miracle. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Leah, we are running out of time. This has been so fun to chat with you. But I want to ask you one other thing. Yeah. You've told us a lot. And, and, you know, you can Google Leah Michelle and you can find all kinds of things about you. But is there one thing that people don't know about you that would surprise them? And bonus points if you have a photo of it that you might be willing to share with us. Oh, my God. Well, I told you I delete all the pictures off of my phone. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I scroll through something, I'll find some inspiration right now. Something that people don't know about me. I'm scrolling through my phone. I mean, this is like the first picture that comes up. Just like a very pregnant, a very pregnant me. The morning before, this is the morning on the way to the C-section. I love it. You did document it, girl. I did. I did. And now- You got to get your your chat books now. Something that people, I think that, you know, uh, you save the most intense and long-winded answer for, for the end. But I think that there's a lot of things about me that, you know, people may not know. And especially I feel that becoming a mom, it's like, like you said, it's like our, our child is born, but we are also born as well. And so I'm just really excited for this next chapter of my life to continue to get to know myself and for other people to get to know me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so where can we find your album? You guys we yes. need this. When is it available? Where can we find it? It is coming out in November. You can find it everywhere. And, but especially, you know, if you always check my social media and website, you'll continue to get all the updates on everything forever. All right. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is so wonderful. And I love getting to talk about 
all of this, it just makes me so happy. And I am grateful and because it's 206 and I'm going to go and give yeah. my baby a bottle right now Yay, good. and make sure that his father isn't, you know, having him hang upside down and do some sort of mission impossible <laughs> baby drop from the ceiling stunt while I've been gone. All the good stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy your time there. And thanks again for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Right, okay. Have a great bye. day. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you for joining the Mom Force. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review and come join the conversation over on our Mom Force Facebook group. And check out the show notes for a special chapbooks discount code. Until next time.